So I'm Don Bailey. It's my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis. Um, I will do a very brief introduction because we want to spend most of our time listening to her uh, talk today. So Liz is a pediatric neurologist at Rush University Medical uh, Center. She uh, did her undergraduate work in Notre Dame, did an MD, PhD, uh, a PhD in biochemistry and an MD at uh, University of Chicago. Um, she'll tell you a little bit about her history, about how she got into Fragile X and, um, uh, and, and what she's doing now, but suffice it to say she is one of the top people in the world uh, studying Fragile X syndrome uh, and involved in multiple uh, clinical trials for uh, different medications. It's a very exciting time in Fragile X now. It's a great example of, uh, clinical, and trans of tr clinical and translational science of basic discoveries leading to a whole new generation of targeted medical treatments, then becoming uh, lots of hope and then complications in, uh, in, in the clinical trials. I've just given your whole talk right there, Liz. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in addition to being a professor at Rush and uh, doing her own research, um, she runs a, cl a Fragile X clinic. Um, she sees hundreds of families and patients every year. She's also a director of the Fragile X Clinical and Research Consortium. This is a consortium of, what is it now, 25 clinics or so around the nation um, and that's, that are joined together under the umbrella of the National Fragile X Foundation to uh, support research uh, and, and clinical services in, in Fragile X. Uh, so, um, uh, there's one other thing I was going to say, but I can't remember now, but maybe I'll remember it a little bit later. But anyway, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis. Oh, I do know, I do know what I was going to say. Um, so these talks are very hard to organize because um, everybody will leave here both happy and frustrated because we asked Liz to talk to a very broad audience um, of, 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 of educated people, some of whom are basic scientists who will be frustrated that she's not giving more detail about the basic science. Others of you are more clinically oriented um, or health communications people, and you'll be going, what does that slide mean? Um, but I hope everybody will walk away with um, some, some good ideas about next steps, and Liz is going to be here working with us in various meetings throughout the day. She's a consultant on one of our research projects, and we have a new Fragile X Center grant um, uh, application under review, and she's going to be running the molecular core for us uh, when, when that's funded. So, so now I'll introduce Liz Barry Kravis. Okay, thank you, Don, and, and thanks for inviting me to uh, come here and talk about everything going on in the Fragile X field in uh, one hour. So um, I... Uh, I, I think it is a really, really exciting time to be in the Fragile X field. I mean, we, the, this, you know, the, the translational research in this disease is moving faster than practically any other area. And when I was in seventh grade, I, I told people I wanted to understand what the brain was doing when we were thinking, what kinds of chemicals were moving around, and, and, and how that correlated with thinking. And so I think in the Fragile X field, I've gotten about as close to that as, as one possibly could in a career. So anyway, um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Fragile X is and then um, talk a little bit about the basic science of um, what the Fragile X protein does and then talk about um, how we're using that information for translational research right now. Um, so I always like to show this picture at the beginning. Let me see if the, this, this guy, this is one of my Fragile X patients, and this is the first model rocket that he built. And uh, I like to show it because um, the models for Fragile X have really led us to where we are today and because um, I think that what we're doing right now in the Fragile X field is really rocket science. Um, okay, so what is Fragile X? Uh, Fragile X associated disorders are a group of disorders that are all associated with CGG expansion mutations in FMR1. And the expansion mutation occurs right where the old, this is the way we used to diagnose Fragile X before the gene was found and there was this fragile site on the X chromosome from which the disease got its name. Um, and, and so the CGG expansion is right there where the fragile site is. Um, and the full, the full mutation, which is over 200 CGG repeats um, in the beginning of this gene, causes Fragile X syndrome. Um, and occurs in about one in 4,000 males and females um, across really worldwide. Um, Premutation mutation 
carriers um, have 55 to 200 repeats, and we originally thought that wasn't, that was just associated with the propensity to pass on Fragile X syndrome, but we now know that there are at least two uh, diseases that very clearly occur in, in carriers of these smaller mutations, and they don't get Fragile X syndrome, but they do get Fragile X tremor, Fragile X associated tremor ataxia syndrome, which is a late onset uh, neurodegenerative condition, and Fragile X associated primary ovarian insufficiency or FAXPOI, which is um, actually the single most common genetic cause of early menopause. Um, so the, the premutation frequency has been um, ascertained from a couple of large studies, one by Marsha Malik Selzer and one by um, us with a newborn screening project we're doing with Dr. Tasson. Uh, and it looks like um, in the USA, premutation carrier, the premutation carrier, the premutation occurs in about one in 151 to one in 209 females. About 25% of those have a risk for fax poi and about 10% a risk for about 10% get symptoms of fax tax. And in, in males, the premutation occurs in about 1 in 430 to 1 in 468 males, and these, these guys have about a 50% risk of, of fax tests. Uh, so, these, so this is a whole group of disorders that obviously affects the whole family in multiple generations, and these disorders occur in all ethnic groups worldwide. Now, Fragile X is um, the most common known genetic cause of autism and the most common known inherited form of cognitive disability. Downs is a little bit more frequent than um, Fragile X, but uh, it's not inherited. It's typically a sporadic um, extra chromosome. Um, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about how the fMR1 gene causes um, these three different diseases, and it, depending on what the mutation is. Um, and so this is the, this would be the normal state in this cartoon, where fMR1 has 10 to 45 CGG repeats at the beginning of the gene, which is considered um, the normal range. Um, and so then the RNA is made, and because the repeat sequence is transcribed, um, it's in. It, the uh, the CGG repeat is in the RNA, but it's in the five prime untranslated region for the protein. So the CGG repeat does not code for a an amino acid repeat sequence in in the protein. It's not part of the translated region. Oops. Um, and so. Uh, so when this repeat gets a little bit longer, um, we have a premutation, which is defined as 55 to 200 CGGs, and between 45 and 55 is called the, the gray zone, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but there are studies going on in that um, group of, of individuals. Um, so when, um, when one has a premutation, um, the RNA is made, and there's this long CGG repeat within the RNA, um, and then uh, and, and the RNA is actually made to excess for reasons that, that people don't completely understand. Um, and then the protein is, is made normally from the RNA because this longer CGG repeat, again, doesn't affect the composition of the protein. Um, but because of this long repeat, the protein isn't made as effectively. The, the RNA stalls at the ribosome more easily. Um, but there's more RNA. So you tend, at least in blood, you tend to have roughly normal um, fMRP or Fragile X protein levels in people who have have a premutation. So they don't have Fragile X syndrome, um, but they do have this, this RNA with this big long repeat in it accumulating in the nucleus, and that tends to stick to proteins and causes inclusions to form, and uh, this then um, can disrupt nuclear processes like transcription and splicing and, and causes the late onset neurodegenerative condition fax tests as well as ovarian toxicity and fax poi. Um, in Fragile X syndrome, we have a completely different mechanism going on from what is happening in the premutation. Um, individuals with Fragile X have this big long mutation, and for whatever reason, the cell decides that it can't tolerate that big long CGG repeat and methylates it and shuts the gene down. Um, and so no fMR1 RNA is made and no fMRP, and that is the cause of Fragile X syndrome. Fragile X is a null mutation. It's a condition where there is absence of fMRP, and the absence of fMRP RP leads to the synaptic deficits and intellectual compromise that we see in Fragile X. Now, the discovery of the gene in 1991 led to a simple DNA test where we can just measure the repeat size to diagnose um, Fragile X syndrome. And once the gene was discovered, it was learned that really this carrier state is passed in families for many, many generations before you actually see Fragile X with the mutation kind of gradually getting bigger through the generations. And this is an example of that. That's called genetic anticipation. And in Fragile X, the form of anticipation that we see is that you 
as the generations go on, you get more and more people who are actually affected with Fragile X syndrome because as the gene gets bigger, it's more likely to expand to the full mutation or the 200 repeat mutation. And this is an example of this in a family. This is grandma who's got a little tiny premutation on the southern blot here. And this is the way um, we've, di we've used to diagnose Fragile X for the last, um, since 91 really. Um, and then this is mom, and she's got a little bit bigger premutation, things that are higher on the gel are bigger. Um, and then this is the child with Fragile X syndrome who has a full mutation and a little bit of mosaicism for a premutation, which is a common kind of thing that we see in people with Fragile X. Um, and so it turns out that the stability and the rate of expansion of these alleles over the generations um, actually has to do with something called AGG interspersion. So I told you initially that this, there was this CGG repeat sequence and implied that it was all CGG. But um, what we've learned is that there actually are AGGs in the sequence for most people, and that those occur about um, 10 and about 20 repeats into the sequence. So the AGGs act as a stabilizing influence, and so you really don't usually get gene instability until you have about 30 consecutive CGGs. And so where these AGGs are and how many there are, there can be zero, there can be one, there can be three or four, um, really has to do with how fast this gene is going to expand in a, in a given family, and we're just starting to study that now. The AGGs may be related to clinical symptoms as well, and that's a subject of future study. Um, okay, so now I'm going to just do a quick description of Fragile X syndrome. So um, Fragile X um, has, is associated with certain physical features, um, like large prominent ears. And here's a guy who has most of the physical features of Fragile X, large prominent ears, um, kind of a long face, a large forehead, prominent jaw, um, and kind of a small scrunched in mid face. And then hyperflexible joints and large testes are very common, with large testes being uh, much more evident after puberty. Um, but as you can see, this guy has almost none of those features and actually looks pretty normal. So the physical features really aren't something you can use to absolutely diagnose a person with Fragile X, and they're really quite variable. Um, what's more consistent is the intellectual disability or learning disability that um, most individuals with a full mutation have, um, as well as motor coordination and praxis problems. Um, behavior problems are extremely common in Fragile X and are probably the number one reason that people come to clinic to, to see me because I can prescribe medications that might help with the very extreme behaviors that families experience that we're going to see a little bit of in a minute. Um, autism can be diagnosed uh, formal autistic disorder in about 18 to 36 percent of patients and an autistic spectrum disorder based on um, scales like the ADOS in, in uh, about half to two-thirds of patients with Fragile X. And seizures occur in about 15 percent. Um, and those are typically seizures that occur younger in life. Most of the, this is a this is a graph um, from a, a paper that I wrote with Don about um, when seizures uh, occur in, in patients with Fragile X syndrome. And um, so we what we see is that most of the seizures have their onset about. Um, between age four and 10, and we see most patients actually growing out of their seizures as they get older. So this is a phenomenon present in younger individuals with Fragile X. Um, strabismus or lazy eye in up to 30%, and then there's a whole host of medical problems that have been said to be increased in Fragile X syndrome, like frequent ear infections and sinus infections and mitral valve prolapse and reflux and allergies, sleep apnea, loose stools. And so actually within the, the Fragile X Clinical and Research Consortium that Don told you about, we're studying right now whether those problems are actually increased in Fragile X over the general population or not. So the intellectual disability is the is really the biggest problem in, in people with Fragile X, and um, typically individuals with Fragile X will present with delays. Some present with motor delays, um, slowness in walking. Uh, probably the majority present with language delays, and then some people who are, some patients who are higher functioning and have language onset pretty much on time may present with behavior or learning problems later on. Um, um, and it, when they become school age. Um, the average adult male with Fragile X has an IQ of about 40 and a mental age of about 5 to 6, but the range is anywhere from severe intellectual disability to um, intellectual functioning in the normal range in individuals who are, who are mosaic for uh, different kinds of mutations. Um, and then the IQ scores tend to be higher when patients are young and decline with age, and there is a specific cognitive profile that we can use to help design school programs that will work well for the patients. Um, achievement and adaptive skills tend to be a little bit higher 
higher than you would predict based on the measured IQ um, because the IQ test is very abstract and difficult for patients with fragile X. And so um, this is just a, an MRI, a functional MRI uh, scan from one of Alan Reese's projects. And this is a girl with fragile X. These are girls with fragile X that he had go in the MRI scanner and do mental math in the, in the scanner. And the reason that boys aren't in this project is that you can't really get fragile X boys to go in the scanner and lay there and do mental math. That's not going to happen um, in most cases. Um, so as you can see, when typically developing girls do math in their head, a lot of the brain lights up. You have to use a lot of your brain to do math. And the fragile X girls have a lot of, they're really just not bringing in all those areas of the brain that are needed to do the math. And this is what the, the learning issue is. It's a problem with brain connectivity. And this becomes um, clear when we look at what is what what we've learned from the fragile X model about um, why about the wiring problems in the brain. Um, so fragile X syndrome is associated with this kind of typical cognitive pattern. Executive function def deficits are very prominent, but strengths are things like receptive vocabulary, syntax, imitation ability, um, grammatical structure, visual memory, um, and then simultaneous processing and experiential learning. Guys with fragile X are really good at seeing something done and then repeating it. And if they see it done enough times, they get very good at repeating it, um, which is why one of our four-year-olds watched his father start the car a lot of times and then one day took the car keys and backed the car out of the driveway because this was experiential learning. Um, they're not very good with a series of directions. So if the teacher stands up in class and says, do this, then do this, then do this, they can't keep those directions in mind um, because of problems with auditory processing and sequencing and um, working memory. Um, abstraction is, is difficult. Math is a tremendously difficult area for, for both girls and guys with fragile X. And then coordination is a problem for, uh, for writing skills. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you a couple of videos of behavior in Fragile X. Behavior is one of the things that the families repeatedly tell us is the biggest issue for them, like they can't take their child out or go to the grocery store. Um, and so this is a kid. Um, He's, he's got fragile X syndrome. He had a diagnosis of autism initially, but then was, the fragile X test was done, it was positive. Um, and you can see that he's very agitated through um, much of his day at school. He kind of, uh, he tantrums, he hits himself, he hits other kids. This was the, he, this was the video that the school brought in when he was referred for treatment to us. Um, so this is this kind of anxiety and just crawling out of your skin and being agitated all day long um, when you're in an environment where you're being asked, having demands placed and asked to do things. Um, this this is what we see a lot of and and what we have to try to manage with a combination of medications and, and adjustments of the school program. Um, and then this is a video of. Um, this is, a, this is just the hand flapping. These are motor stereotypies. Motor stereotypies are very common in Fragile X syndrome, these kind of odd movements that, that people make. And we've actually been studying those as a possible outcome measure. But he does a, he, this is just a good example of it here. Um, I think I restarted that. So he's kind of hyperactive and, and difficult to get to um, do anything specific. OK. Um, now, this is an example of language. Listen carefully to what he says. Okay. Um, so that's just a. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so that's just an example of the perseverative language. That guy, he never says anything less than three times um, when he's in conversation. And this is a very strong trait associated with fragile X. And in fact, even when you compare um, fragile X patients to autistic patients, the perseverative language is higher in people with fragile X syndrome. So again, you know, a, a characteristic trait that 
um, that we might, if we could modify it, we might be looking at how to modify the, the, the entire condition. Um, so uh, treatment right now for Fragile X Syndrome is supportive. Um, we push early intervention. We work on getting kids into therapy. We think that helps a lot with, uh, with adaptive um, skills. Uh, we try to work with the schools to to have an education program that's optimized for the cognitive and behavioral and emotional pro profile of the child. Behavior modification, we try to manage the medical problems. If kids are having frequent ear infections and they can't hear, then that's going to be um, an issue for them, both behaviorally and with respect to learning and language. Um, we manage the seizures with medicines that don't aggra aggravate behavior. We manage vision problems. And then, you know, often it does come to psychopharmacology for behavior because even if we put in all those perfect systems at school, uh, we still kind of have to take the edge off of some of the anxiety and the hyperactivity and other um, behaviors uh, to really get in the door in terms of the behavior strategies. And then genetic counseling, obviously, since this is a disease that affects the whole family through multiple generations, genetic counseling is a huge part of, of what we do in a Fragile X clinic. Um, so we, we think the supportive treatment is helpful, and this is a study that we got together about five years ago from patients that were treated in our, our clinic, and we actually just looked at um, all the people who had been treated. And so the blue bars represent if you had attention problems or hyperactivity and we started you on a stimulant for that that problem to try to treat that symptom. If we used one medication, we had about a 50% response rate. And these are clinical response rates, not like clinical trials. It, we're talking about uh, a patient that seemed to be doing better when for, the parents thought the patient was better, the teachers thought the patient was better, and they stayed on the medication for six months without side effects and continued to seem to be better. So these are clinical response rates. If we tried several medications, then that would be like the red bar where we get about a 70% response rate because we've tried a couple of different things and found the one that maybe worked best. Um, and we have a similar situation with um, SSRIs for um, anxiety and mood, um, with antipsychotics for aggression and irritability, and with alpha agonists for, hy for hyperarousal. Um, but, you know, how well are those medicines really working? And uh, I was part of a paper with Don again where we asked how families perceive the efficacy of these medications that we use in clinic. And so um, the green people felt like their medicine was really helping a lot. And as you can see, we don't do all that well except in the category of seizures where we pretty much can control all the seizures with medication. Um, and and uh, the red people thought their medication was helping somewhat, and the blue people didn't think they'd had any benefit at all. So clearly, uh, we're not managing symptoms completely. And even these green people, where it helps a lot, we're certainly not normalizing the symptom. Um, so we clearly have an unmet need for better behavioral treatments and actually for cognitive treatments, of which we have none. Um, and so in order to do that, you know, we're probably not going to be able to use just supportive treatment. We're going to need to treat the underlying disorder. Um, and so um, now I'm going to kind of move into discussion of what the underlying disorder is and how we might go about that. So um, we know that FMRP expression is related to disability. In other words, um, patients that people from girls and mosaic males, we know that when you have some FMRP, um, you might just have problems with social anxiety or shyness or executive deficits. And as you get less and less FMRP, there's learning disability and then eventually intellectual disability. And this is exemplified by this um, girl and, and her brother. So he has typical Fragile X syndrome and she just has a learning disability because she has FMRP in some of her cells as a girl. Um, and so we know fMRP is important, but what does it do? So fMRP, this is, I'm going to summarize in the next two slides a body of research that came about over about 15 years. And um, so fMRP binds to RNAs in, in, in the brain and in really all cells. And it binds a, a population of RNAs particularly well that contain this G quartet structure, and that consists of 4% of RNAs in the brain. It binds through domains in the protein that are called KH domains and RGG box. And RGG box, and it binds and regulates its own mRNA. Um, recent data shows that binding to RNAs is not restricted to the G quartet. So the, the, as time goes on, we recognize that it's more and more complicated what exactly fMRP does and what it binds to. But we know the RNA binding is 
is key because um, there's a male identified with very severe fragile X syndrome who has a point mutation in the first KH domain sequence, and his protein doesn't bind RNA as well as it should, and so without that RNA binding, he's severely affected. Um, the bound RNAs turn out to code for all kinds of proteins that are really important in synaptic function like MAP1B and CAMK2, PSD95, PIKE, PI3K, um, and I'm not going to name all these off, but the blue ones are ones where there's actually been a measurement in cells from the Fragile X mouse that's shown that these proteins are dysregulated and are either increased or, or their, function is, their function is either increased or decreased in, in brain cells from, from uh, the mouse with Fragile X. Um, and we we also know that fMRP has a role in shuttling things from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, and it has a nuclear localization signal and a nuclear export signal. Um, so um, it's an RNA binding protein, um, but what is its role in RNA binding? And it turns out that fMRP is uh, very important in, in inhibition of translation and, and maybe other things. So fMRP works um, in a, it, it, act, it, it, it works by um, acting with act by interacting with actively transcribing ribosomes through uh, MRMP. Um, it works as a protein complex. It dimerizes with, it, with itself and then interacts with um, uh, FXR, with the FXR1 and FXR2, as well as other proteins in a, in a complex in the MRMP particle. Um, it binds to BC1, and is a, which is a translational repressor of specific RNAs. Um, and it binds to the RNA to the RNAi system, the small inhibitory RNAs, um, and, and targets SI RNAs to specific RNA targets um, at the ribosome. And so there is this mechanism that's, that's been worked out that suggests that there's receptor activation in a neural cell, and then there's a there's a that's the, and then there's a process of, of fMRP dephosphorylation that's dependent on a receptor being activated. And then this gives a decrease in AGO, uh, decrease in RNI interaction, increased dicer interaction. And the net result is that there's a loss of interaction of fMRP with bound RNAs after a receptor is activated. And so there's a transient release of, a blo of the block in translation that fMRP is exerting and a pulse of protein synthesis. Um, and so we thought for many years that this was, this was really the main thing that fMRP does. But recently, there's been some evidence that fMRP actually interacts directly with some synaptic proteins, such as the SLAC calcium channel and modifies those proteins directly as opposed to just working through RNA. So the functions of fMRP may be, um, become increasingly more complicated the more we study it. Um, okay, so how have we studied? So, so um, a lot of the early RNA data was just based on um, cellular models, um, but to really study, you know, physiology and to develop drugs, we have to have a model. And so luckily in Fragile X, we do have a model, which was mm, affectionately named Busby by the Fraxa organization. And this is the Fragile X knockout mouse. And in the mouse, the fMR1 gene is inactivated. It doesn't have a CGG repeat. It just has a neomycin cassette stuck in the middle of the gene, so the gene can't do anything. Um, and so no active fMRP is made in the mouse. The mouse has rather subtle cognitive problems. When they first made the mouse, they spent a long time trying to find things that were difficult enough for the mouse to do to actually measure its deficit. It's deficits, but it does have um, deficits. The mouse has audiogenic seizures when it's a young mouse, about the same kind of timing as when patients with fragile X have seizures. And it turns out the mouse brain looks a lot like human brains that have been studied in terms of the morphology of the neurons. And so it's a good neurobiological model to answer the question, what does fMRP do? Um, so it turns out fMRP um, is, a, is a regulator of synaptic plasticity uh, and morphological maturation of dendritic spines. Um, and so if we activate a neuron, and this is the, our presynaptic neuron being activated, then the postsynaptic or receiving neuron, if it's activated enough, actually changes, changes morphology and becomes, and this synapse becomes a more mature um, synapse. So fMRP, um, sits um, in these dendrites and um, regulates the dendritic protein translation in response to synaptic activation that's responsible for this synaptic maturation. Um, and this is a picture from Gary Bissell that shows that fMRP is sitting right here in this dendrite. Um, and so, but if, and if one looks at, at 
the mouse brain, or the human brain for that matter, um, I'm going to try to convince you here. This is the wild type mouse brain, uh, and these are the, the dendritic spines. And we have more of these short, stubby ones that are the more mature ones. And uh, in the fragile X mouse, we have more of these kind of long, spindly ones, which are the immature ones. So FMRP is regulating maturation of dendritic spines um, in the mouse. And it turns out um, it also regulate, it regulates not only the morphological maturation, but also the um, synaptic strength. And so um, just as a brief introduction to, to glutamate receptors, because FMRP appears to re regulate glutamate receptor-mediated processes, um, in, a, in, a, in a neuron, uh, in a postsynaptic neuron, um, there are there are multiple kinds of glutamate receptors, and, and the ones I'm going to mention today, there are, are AMPA receptors, which are the red ones here, and so they're kind of responsible for the strength in the synapse. The more AMPA receptors you have, the stronger the synapse. And then there are MGLUR receptors, which are sitting kind of at the periphery of the synapse and are regulatory receptors that regulate how many AMPA receptors are out here and what's the strength of the connection. And then NMDA receptors are the main depolarizing receptors of the neural cell. And so um, Mark Baer discovered, Mark Baer and Kim Huber discovered in 2003 that there was um, exaggerated long-term depression. Long-term depression is synaptic weakening um, in, in the mouse with, with Fragile X. Um, and this is an example of that exaggerated long-term depression. This would be the normal mouse, and then this is the Fragile X mouse, where there's this excessive weakening. The synapse is always driven toward um, excessive weakening when um, activated through the MGLUR5 or MGLUR1 receptor. Um, and then other discoveries around that time uh, showed that AMPA receptors were being excessively internalized. So AMPA receptors were being pulled into the cell, and we're getting these kind of weak synapses with less AMPA receptors that LTP was actually reduced in cortex of the mouse with Fragile X. Uh, and so not only are these synapses that appear more immature, they, they're more, they appear more immature, but they're also actually weaker in terms of transmission of impulses. And these findings do vary from one brain region and one neuronal type to another, depending on the forms of plasticity expressed by that particular kind of neuron. So the, the situation is very complex. Um, but um, that resulted in a model, and, and so the idea here is that when normal learning occurs, we're trying to, if you and I are trying to learn what 2 plus 3 is, um, we're going to fire a, a set of, a network of neurons, and we're going to keep firing it, and we're going to try a couple times, and then eventually um, the, the neurons in that system are basically going to mature so that we have these more mature connections that can facilitate the impulse to go through here, and that's dependent on protein synthesis that's needed to, to adjust this and to strengthen that connection and mature the spine shape the way it needs to be. So if we look just at this um, dendrite, um, and, then, um, and then, then we can use that dendrite to look at what the MGLUR theory, which Mark Baer proposed in 2002 when he and Kim uh, published the paper. Um, so this is, a, this is a mechanism through which much translational research, which much translational research has been based on um, since its discovery. So I'm just going to kind of run through the mechanism in this, in this cartoon, which is a simplified version of the mechanism. Um, so basically in the brain, we have a lot of glutamate. It's the main excited transmitter in brain, and glutamate activates these MGLUR5 receptors, which kind of result in the AMPA receptors moving around at the synapse, um, but until protein synthesis is activated, and that protein synthesis is activated by, again, kicking fMRP off the ribosome so it no longer is inhibiting protein synthesis, and then we get more of these proteins. And some of those proteins are what we call LTD proteins, which pull AMPA receptors into the cell. Um, but one of the proteins that's made or recruited um, as a result of this process is fMRP itself, which then acts based as, basically as the negative feedback so that you can get just the right amount of, of connectivity that's necessary based on how much, the, how much impulse the neuron is receiving at any one particular time. Well, in Fragile X, we don't have fMRP, so what happens is we get constitutive signaling through this pathway, and so we have all these proteins that are kind of being made constantly to excess. Oops. All right. I'm having trouble with the... Uh, 
with the thing here. Um, so we get these proteins all being made to excess, and they're sucking in extra AMPA receptors. And so the, the synapse is electrophysiologically weaker, uh, and it's also remaining more morphologically immature based on this excess protein synthesis. And you can actually measure that excess protein synthesis in the mouse brain. And this is a study from Carolyn Beebe Smith at NIH. This is the wild type mouse, and this is the fragile X mouse. And you can see there's increased protein synthesis um, in the brain. Um, and so that was the, the, the version I showed you was kind of the simplified version. This cascade of um, mGluR5 activation of protein synthesis is actually very complex, and signaling actually occurs through both the ERK pathway and through the mTOR pathway. Um, so, so there's a lot of cross regulation a lot of cross-regulation here. There are many, many proteins that are being regulated at translation by fMRP, including some of the proteins in the cascade itself. And so um, this can lead to, once this thing gets overactivated, it kind of perpetuates itself. Uh, and then there are many other new mechanisms that are getting discovered, including endocannabinoids regulate, are regulated by this mechanism, uh, as well as some direct regulation of, of, pro, of uh, potassium channels. So we have many, many targets. I think the important thing here is that we have a a lot of potential targets to work with for treatment of, uh, of Fragile X syndrome. Uh, and this is where I'm just going to throw in a quick thing here. Um, the way I got into the Fragile X field, actually, this is my first paper on Fragile X in 1992, where we showed that cyclic AMP production was low in cells from patients with Fragile X. And at that time, the gene hadn't really been discovered when we first started this yet, so we didn't understand. Um, we, we thought this was related to the intellectual dysfunction in Fragile X, but no one believed us because it was just a chromosome fragility disorder then. Um, and we showed that if we made transfected neural cells, we could increase cyclic AMP production in cells that were overexpressing the Fragile X protein. Um, and, then, and then for a long time, you know, we didn't kind of have anywhere to go with that. And then Jen Darnell showed in 2001 that there was an adenylate cyclase that was an RNA target for fMRP. And then in 2006, Anita but. Bhattacharya showed that cyclic AMP production was actually decreased in the mouse brain and in stem cells from individuals with Fragile X. So this has been kind of an exciting validation of this early research I did. And by 2006, I had drifted into translational work, and so wasn't doing this work in the lab anymore. But I was delighted to see that other people were able to um, recapitulate this. And just this, just in 2012, um, it turns out that the metab that the mGlur5 receptor um, has a has a mechanism through which it it inhibits cyclic AMP signaling in Drosophila. So, um, so it looks like there's a, there is a connection between, uh, between my early work and what's going on now. Um, anyhow, um, so in learning in Fragile X, so if we take go back to our learning model in Fragile X, um, it turns out that we try to learn and try to learn, and we have to mature those synapses. So the idea would be that we just can't um, generate the, the synaptic maturation that's needed. And even when the Fragile X patient does learn something, if they don't work on it constantly, uh, those connections can't maintain the mature state because of that excess mGluR signaling. Okay, um, And this may vary from one brain region to another, because we know people with Fragile X are really good with visual memory, and they're really bad with math, for instance. And so there may be variation in different um, brain areas. Um, and so now that we have this mechanism, um, we can hopefully use it to think up potential treatment targets for people with Fragile X. So I'm going to go back to the simpler mechanism here and talk about the various kinds of treatments that people have thought about. Um, so one is to try to block the signaling between the mGlur5 receptor and the ribosome. And this includes things like lithium and PI3K blockers, PAC inhibitors, ERK inhibitors. Um, Perhaps a simpler thing would just be to block the glutamate activation of the mGlur receptor. And uh, this includes um, there are a number of mGlur blockers that are, are currently being evaluated. Some are just in animal models, and others are going into people. Um, or perhaps some of these proteins, perhaps some of these proteins that are regulated are key proteins. And if we just adjusted the activity, the excess activity of those proteins, um, we could uh, improve Fragile X. And these are the examples of this are things like minocycline or cyclic AMP activators, step inhibitors, APP inhibitors. Um, or if we could get more AMPA receptors out to the synapse or activate those AMPA receptors, that might be a successful mechanism. Or we could work on other systems that might actually modulate the amount of glutamate in the synapse, um, things like GABA receptors. Um, and there are a number of, of agents that are being worked on in that area. 
Uh, or um, in, people have even thought about using microRNAs to try to decrease um, the excess protein production at the ribosome. So all agents in all of these categories are currently in work somewhere in either clinical translational work or um, basic science work. And in fact, you can wear this mechanism as a hat um, if you're at the right kind of a hat party. Um, so the idea would be that um, we could then, um, so the green, the green, um, the green dots here are would be the drug, and so the idea would be we could put the drug into the brain of someone with fragile X, and then they could try to learn, and we would make it easier for them to strengthen and mature those connections. Um, so. There, there has been some progress in this, and I'm going to take you through three examples of potential treatment for Fragile X based on, um, based on this mechanism. So one is lithium, which blocks PI turnover, and GSK3 beta signaling, which are in the pathway between the MGLUR receptor and, um, and protein synthesis. And lithium has been effective at reversing behavioral phenotypes and spine and dendritic spine phenotypes in the mouse and fly. So we did a proof of concept two-month trial in 15 patients and used a bunch of different outcome measures, um, one of which was our favorite outcome measure, the aberrant behavior checklist, which is a measure of all those difficult behaviors that people with Fragile X have. And, and lower scores are better. So um, you can see on the, on the checklist, people treated with, patients treated with lithium, their, their aberrant behavior scores came down and then stayed down even in patients who stayed on the medication for a year. Um, we also had a verbal memory measure called the R bands that we're now using in other trials, and, and um, we had a significant increase in verbal memory on the R bands in the patients who were treated with lithium. And then we had a, a, a measure of ERK activation rate that we were doing with, uh, with Bill Greeno at the time and showed that ERK activation was slower, meaning the activation times were higher, and that came down to normal when we were treating the patients with lithium. So this was a good um, proof of concept trial, but we don't really want to have to treat people with lithium their entire life because it's got a lot of toxicity. Um, so people are working on other pathway targets that might have less toxicity, including PAC inhibitors and PI3K blockers and GSK3 beta blockers. Um, so that's one example. Another example would be mechanism four, where we were going to decrease, uh, we're going to alter um, things, the, the things coming into the neuron and activating those MGLUR5 receptors. And uh, the best example of this is, is uh, a drug called Arbaclofen, or STX209, which is a GABA B agonist. And this is being developed by Seaside Therapeutics right now. And so the idea here is that the STX209 binds to the GABA B receptor here, which decreases is the presynaptic output of glutamate, and then because the MGLUR5 receptors are sort of at the edge of the synapse, we get reduction of these bad proteins, uh, and then should see improvement in people with, with fragile X. Um, so in the fly, there, so in the fly and mouse, there are a number of good studies that support um, doing a trial in in man. And uh, one thing they were able to see in the fly in the mouse is that the the uh, protein synthesis came down when they used our baclofen. Um, the AMPA receptor internalization normalized, and the dendritic spines um, came came down to normal size and density. Um, so, and also the audiogenic seizures were reversed and some behavior phenotypes. So this prompted a placebo-controlled crossover trial run by Seaside Therapeutics in 63 subjects with Fragile X. This is the biggest um, placebo-controlled trial ever done in Fragile X um, up to that point. And the drug had a good safety and side effect profile. And these are just some of the results of that initial um, phase two exploratory study. So they guessed that irritability on the behavior checklist, in other words, aggressive and irritable behavior, behavior would be the thing that would improve most, and that didn't actually come out as the, the thing that improved most. Um, there was a trend toward improvement on the overall clinical global impression of how the patients were doing in one treatment period to another, and, uh, and the treatment preference, i.e., they had four weeks of our baclofen and then four weeks of placebo, and we didn't know which pa what patients were on which in which order, and so we picked uh, which four weeks they were better, and there was 
certainly a trend toward a preference for the, our baclofen week. Um, and then, but the one thing that did get better, and this is kind of interesting, it speaks to our outcome measures. Um, we asked the families, what are the three worst things that your patient with Fragile X does that you would most like to go away? And, and so, and then we asked them to rate that on a visual analog scale. And that did actually get significantly better on the, our baclofen, which suggests that our, um, the behaviors may be all over the place and we may be having trouble finding one good outcome measure for them. And then the other thing is, we observed that our favorite checklist, the ABC, um, the behaviors that were improving were falling all over the place and it didn't look like it was validated correctly for Fragile X. And so we refactored the ABC in a big project between five, five different sites um, for Fragile X. And then the social avoidance scale on the refactored ABC uh, did come out as significant in the entire study group. Um, and so this is just a, a, a look at when you fractionate these groups into different clinical groups, um, actually this is the overall global improvement and it's, it wasn't quite significant in the entire study, but if you look at the group that had autism, it was significant. And if you look at the group that had low sociability scores on the Barrett Behavior Checklist going into the study, we did have a significant um, improvement in those groups. So those groups were apparently enriched in the people who were responders. Um, and so we think the behavior this drug is getting at is like this, where the Fragile X patient um, wants to kind of get in the pool with the other patients, wants to be social, but is too anxious to be able to do it. Um, and a lot of people had stories that support the thinking that that might be one of the behaviors that's getting better. When we look at the low sociability group, there's a whole, really everything got significantly better. So it seemed like that was the group that the drug was targeting best, um, including the CGI, um, the treatment preference, the ABC social withdrawal scale, and even on the Vineland, the socialization um, measure got better. Um, and then even when we did a more stringent analysis where we looked at um, the, the patients had to have a CGI of one or two, which is much or very much improved, um, and a social withdrawal improvement score of greater than 25%, we still see a significant result in this lower sociability subgroup. So it seems clear there are subgroups that respond um, better to these treatments, and there are two new trials that are in progress based on um, this result. Then Seaside had something called an extension where you were allowed to go into, um, where you were allowed to go on our baclofen treatment and stay on it, um, presumably until FDA approval. And so this is just the, this is some very preliminary data uh, from the Vineland communication scale in patients who were treated for a year with our, with the R baclofen. Uh, and you can see most of them kind of have similar scores, maybe a little bit up. Um, one that goes down here, what we think is a scoring artifact in the, on the part of the family. Um, and so it looks like maybe the Arbaclofen is stabilizing these communication scores, where if you look at um, the Vineland composite, we don't have precise data to compare here, but if we look at natural history data from a paper by Fish in 1996, um, if you test patients with Fragile X on the Vineland and then retest them again two years later, their scores tend to go down. So just keeping the scores the same would be a significant effect for a medication. Um, okay, so the third example of targeted treatment I'm going to talk about is the MGLARB5 blockers, which have been thought of kind of as the great white hope among lots of the families with Fragile X. And these have been studied extensively in the mouse model and shown to reverse all kinds of phenotypes, including the audiogenic seizures, um, the epileptiform discharges that the mouse gets, um, and the dendritic spine phenotypes, as well as a whole host of other um, behavioral phenotypes, the excess LTD, the excess protein synthesis, um, and the AMPA receptor internalization. And in fact, phenotypes in the Fragile X fly, like courtship and odor shock memory, are reversed by the MGLR5 blockers. And even if you cross the FMR1 knockout to an MGLR5 heterozygous mutant with half the MGLR5 receptors, you see improvement in these phenotypes. So very strong suggestion that either pharmacological or genetic modulation um, helps um, it helps the, the Fragile X mouse uh, by reducing MGLR5 receptor activity. Um, and this is just a cellular model. This is a kind of neat experiment that was done in Steve Warren's lab, where this, this is the, the white is the fMRP staining. So this is a control cell, and if you use an siRNA to block fMRP translation, you've got no fMRP here. And when you have no fMRP, those surface glue R1, which is the AMPA receptor, um, goes away, 
uh, and this is kind of his neat study where he could show that the that when the when the um, AMPA receptors were on the outside of the neuron, they were red, and when they went inside, they were they were they were they stained green. Um, and so these AMPA receptors were leaving the outside of the neuron and going into the neuron. And then when they used MPEP, which is an MGLR5 blocker, it brought the AMPA receptors back to the outside of the of the neuron, um, which suggests that even in the cellular model, you can reverse. Um, a deficit, and then this is just a quick video of audiogenic seizures. Both of these, this, this, this is the fragile X mouse on both sides of the um, container here, and this mouse over here got MPEP, and this mouse didn't. And so there, there's a tone, and then the mouse runs around. Real, it has this rapid running, and then it has a little convulsion. And this mouse over here is completely protected. Um, and then in a minute here, there's going to be another um, tone. And, and you know, this mouse is going to have another audiogenic seizure um, while these mice are completely protected on the, on the MPEP. Um, so it seems like this was a, there's pretty strong evidence that we should start looking at this as a translational, um, as, a, as an agent that could be translated to people. Um, we did a brief trial of an MGLR blocker by the name of Phenobom, which the FDI grac graciously allowed us to give one dose to people with Fragile X. And so Randy and I studied 12 individuals with Fragile X, and we tried to come up with an outcome measure that might measure um, improvement after one dose. And what we used was pre-pulse inhibition, which is kind of a measure of sensory oversensitivity. And we did the improvement on the phenobom in that measure, which is which is abnormal in people with fragile X. Um, we saw improvement in the phenobom treated group over a test retest control group, and there were no importantly there were no safety events. Um, but phenobom has erratic PK, so we've kind of moved on to working with um, and, and and Neurofarm, the company that was developing it, went out of business. So we've moved on to working with Roche and Novartis um, on oops. On, M on MGLR5 blockers, and Novartis ran an initial trial of um, the MGLR5 blocker AFQ056 in Europe, which was a, um, a crossover design trial where patients had um, 28 days of one treatment or another. And what they saw in that trial was that on the aberrant behavior checklist, which was their primary outcome, the fully methylated patients got a lot better, and the partially methylated patients were all over the place which you might think would be reasonable because the partially methylated patients may be making fMRP in some of their cells, and so then um, the drug might not be quite as effective. Um, the, part, the fully methylated patients improved on a whole host of other measures, including clinician global um, impressions and several other um, repetitive behavior scale and other behavioral scales. And this prompted ongoing larger trials with Novartis and Roche that has a very similar drug. And Novartis has an extension to look at long-term effects of, of AFQ in people who participate in their placebo-controlled trials. So I think we're on the way with some of these clinical trials, but I don't want to leave you with the idea that we have any idea what exactly we're doing. Um, so um, this is one of our problems here in the Fragile X field is that, as you saw from that diagram, basic science is just generating one target and one molecule after another for us to potentially use to help patients with Fragile X. But we have a big mismatch in the progress for how do we translate those treatments to people because we don't really have any templates from other disabilities or from previous trial experience how to measure improvement in people with Fragile X. So a little bit we're building the bridge while crossing it. And we have to be careful with that because if you get too far ahead of yourself and do things the wrong way, you may put the kibosh on the whole project. So um, we have a lot of people who are thinking carefully about this all the time. And some of our issues in clinical trials are issues with dosing and whether that will be the same in people who are mosaic and have some cells with fMRP and some cells without and females. And we probably need a careful balance. And one example of that comes from the tuberous sclerosis mouse, which um, Mark Baer showed you can cross with the Fragile X mouse and get a mouse that doesn't have any phenotype. And so the idea is that the tuberous sclerosis mouse, which has you know, which is a model of autism, um, has too little MGLUR activity, and the Fragile X mouse has too much MGLUR activity. And so in theory, um, we want to be right here in the middle, and so in tuberous sclerosis, we might need an MGLUR5 activator. In Fragile X, we probably need an MGLUR5 blocker, but we want to be right right, you know, in that yellow area. So if we use too much of the drug, we could cause the same symptoms that we started with. 
you know, so so this is so dosing may be a big issue, and we may need a careful balance. Safety is an issue. A lot of the drugs that are being identified are are um, components of key signaling pathways that work on all the cells in the body. So if we just use a drug that works on that signal patent pathway, we might cause a. a another disease like cancer or something. Um, so we have to um, be careful about all the off-target effects that we might have with some of our drugs. And so strategies to avoid the body effects for these drugs that work inside the cell, um, such as using a specific isoform of a target protein that's only in brain, which they're trying for PAC inhibitors, or a blocker drug to that doesn't go in the brain like they use in Parkinson's disease to keep the drug from having an effect in peripheral tissues may be important. Um, the timing of treatment may be tremendously important. Um, we, we just don't know. We do know that in the conditional knockout mouse that David Nelson has, you can start making fMRP in the adolescent mouse, and it doesn't appear to be developmentally required. You can reverse everything in the mouse. Also, using the mglr 5 blocker CTEP in the adult fragile X mouse reverses basically all those phenotypes you can reverse in, in young mice. So it really doesn't seem to matter. So being an adult really doesn't seem to matter um, in the mouse. But we have to remember mouse is not man. And by the time man goes to preschool, the mouse has died. Um, so the human brain has a lot more wiring time. And we think there probably are both developmental and acute functions of fMRP. And so in adults, we might be able to um, improve on the things that come from acute functions of fMRP. So we might have a partial improvement but we might have a bigger improvement if we could reverse some of the developmental functions. Um, the length of treatment is another big problem we have. How long before you see a cognitive change in somebody that you start treatment at 30? Um, well, it could be a long time. And in fact, the studies in the CTEP mouse suggest it might be as long as 6 to 12 years if you try to convert mouse time into human time. Um, so it's not clear how long. And But clearly, we can't keep people in a placebo-controlled trial for 6 to 12 years. So we're going to have to think up some ways to maybe speed the learning process. And right now, um, we're working on these intensive language and literacy training um, to try to do during um, treatment with the drug trial trial to see if people learn faster when they're when they're on the drug. And the conditional mouse also tells us we'll need to treat people forever with these drugs because if you take FMRP away in the adult mouse, it gets fragile X. Um, outcome measures is another huge area of problem for us. Um, we have no gold standard outcome measure. We have this basic problem that many of the phenotype measures and biomarkers that translate well from animal models are not things that have a direct correlation to function in life. And so the FDA um, does not is not interested in those um, as primary outcome measures. And these are things like the PPI that I talked about in the Fenebaum study, things like computer um, tests like the KITAP that's an executive function measure. And many of these are things that we've worked on and validated for Fragile X. But again, we need to have a good functional link, eye tracking to measure the gaze aversion that patients have, and pupillometry. Um, we even have a motion monitor where we can measure hyperactivity. And then um, there's some biomarkers like APP that, that we've been using. But these are all exploratory right now. And we have to use key things that the FDA is interested in, like, um, like behavioral checklists. And this is the aberrant behavior checklist. And for many of these, we're probably going to need to revalidate them to be specific for Fragile X, like we've done with the ABC. Um, we have an anxiety measure called the PARS we're working on validating. And then um, the expressive language, we have an expressive language measure we're working on, which turns out to be a really good um, reproducible outcome measure. Uh, and then the other thing that's being done with some of the cognitive measures, David Hessel's mostly working on this, is kind of renorming them for Fragile X. So this is, for instance, is the Stanford Binet. And if everybody scores a 40 on it, it's pretty hard to demonstrate improvement because there's so much floor effect. So we're trying to renorm some of the cognitive measures for Fragile X as well as developing new ones. Um, recruitment. Is an issue for a rare disease. We now have the Fragile X Clinical and Research Consortium, and these are where the clinics are. Um, there's one right here at Duke in North Carolina, and um, this is the number of sites that were in that were in a clinical trial. And about when the consortium came on board here, we were able to see a big increase in the number of sites that could be recruited to uh, to get patients for a clinical trial. And we're going to need this to continue to develop these drugs and get through phase three trials as well as to, to deliver care in Fragile X.
Um, so this is, this is just a brief overview of where all the drugs, I'm just going to put all these out here because I know I'm running short of time here. Um, so many of these drugs are in, there, there are a number of these drugs that are in phase two or phase three um, development, but there's still lots of the drugs that work inside the cell that are in preclinical studies. Um, and we think that actually Fragile X overlaps pathways in autism quite a bit, and Fragile X is obviously one chunk of the autism pie. Um, and we're beginning to know what the other chunks of the autism pie are, and we're learning that there's a strong molecular overlap between um, Fragile X syndrome and autism based on this. So we know that there's a bunch of autism genes that are in that cascade from the MGLUR receptor to protein synthesis signaling that FMRP regulates. We know there's a huge number of genes that FMRP actually binds that are autism genes. And it turns out from studies just this year, um, from four exome um, sequencing studies in, uh, in autistic families, um, half the proteins that were identified in autism exome screens are actually bound by FMRP. So FMRP is kind of an uber regulator of many of the autism genes. Um, and then it appears that there's some convergence of glutamate and GABA, GABA mechanisms in both disorders. Neuroligin 3, which is an autism gene, actually regulates the activity of the MGLUR um, receptor. So um, Fragile X probably has a huge molecular overlap with autism, and drugs that work for Fragile X may well work for patients with autism. So it's not just a clinical model, it's also a molecular model. And this is the first drug that's gone into autism from Fragile X. This is the STX209, the seaside drug. This is an open label trial in autism. And as open label trials always have big, big, tend to have big placebo effects. So this drug was very effective in the open label trial. But the key is that it's being translated into autism based on the work in Fragile X. And I think we'll see a lot more of that as time goes on. Um, and I, I am not going to list all my acknowledgments. We've had funding from FRAXA, the National Fragile X Foundation, um, the National Institutes of Health. Our Fragile X families are definitely our partners in this endeavor. And then we've had clinical trial funding from Seaside, Neurofarm, Roche, and Novartis. And we collaborate with everybody in the world with Fragile X, who works on Fragile X. <laughs> as well as those with Fragile X. And uh, so this is my, this is just the patients. This is a group of patients from my families and clinic, and these are the people uh, that we want to um, bring a better life to. Okay, and that's all I'm going to say. I know I'm over a little bit, and I'm sorry about that, but um, I'm happy to take questions. questions. So I'm curious, you, you didn't have time in this talk to talk about other res, uh, receptor systems and, is, and ion channels. And so GABA-A receptors I've seen in fMR1 knockout mice seem to have decreased expression as well as that hyper m -glue exit, excitatory pathway. Uh, that was one question. The other one, could you characterize um, the concept of tactile defensiveness, which I see in the... <laughs> literature in Fragile X, contrasting that with the tactile hypersensitivity that I know a little bit more about in terms of von Frey's stimulation and autism, uh, mouse models. Yeah, so, um, well, let me, the first one, the GABA-A receptor does appear to be reduced in the Fragile X mouse. Frank Cui's done a lot of work on that in Belgium, and so there is a thinking that there is, um, that there's a need to activate GABA receptors, and that through the GABA-B receptor, you might be able to decrease glutamate signaling, but activating GABA-A receptors would be a good idea, too. There is a drug in development called acamprosate, which works on both GABA-B and GABA-A receptors. Um, Craig Erickson's been studying that, and we think that's kind of a promising mechanism due to the fact that it hits uh, probably several targets. It's kind of a dirty drug, so it also hits NN NMDA receptors, and we don't know if that'll be a problem or not. Um, so that's a, that, that is a mechanism that people are working on. Um, Ganoxalone is another GABA drug that Rondi has in clinical trials um, right now. So, um, and then the, the tactile defensiveness. So um, I... 
I'm not sure it's the tactile stuff is very difficult in fragile X. It, they they just have weird um, tactile perception. So uh, they don't the patient the patients will shy away from touch. They don't like to be touched. They don't like um, things like the tags on their shirts. They're lot, the the little things that that touch their skin bother them. Yet at the same time, they may not even notice if they have a broken arm. Or you can you may be able to do a, a blood test and they won't even flinch. You know, so it's it's they they just have a kind of a misperception. They seem to put the wrong amount of emphasis on a on a sensory stimulus, and and they they don't like to do that final touching. That final approach is difficult. So if I'm doing finger to nose testing in clinic, it, it's very reproducible. A lot of the guys will just go like this. They'll put their finger out. They'll do the test, but they won't quite touch my finger because they don't like it. You know, and I don't I don't know exactly what that is, but I know it happens. Something, or is it? Uh, you know, in young kids, there's always pain aversion. They don't want to get hurt, but um, but it, there's no particular. I don't think there's any particular pain aversion. Like I say, there are many stories of kids with fragile X who are out playing the swing, swing set and broke their arm, and nobody figured it out for two days because they they just weren't bothered by that. about Fragile X as um, maybe being an easy one to figure out because it's a single gene disorder. And that all the other things like autism and, other, and many other, uh, or schizophrenia or other conditions that are clearly polygenic and maybe have multiple causes and multiple pathways. But now we know that, that Fragile X has multiple pathways and multiple targets that could be um, attacked um, through different uh, medication approaches. Have, have we learned any lessons yet from Fragile X that might extend to polygenic diseases, or does it does it mean that polygenic disorders might even be? I mean, they're clearly they're going to be, be even more complicated. Well, you know, I think the lesson we've kind of learned from Fragile X is that there's a lot of things that are modulated, a lot of things the protein does, um, and so we kind of have to pick and choose. Um, which kinds of pathways we can attack. So um, one example would be there are all those proteins that are being overproduced. So it might be hard to have a drug that works on every one of those proteins being overproduced. But if you hit the pathway more proximal, like by working on MGLU-R5 activity or something, you might be able to readjust many things. But even that may not readjust everything. And I, so I think actually um, the idea of looking at taking a systems approach and looking at what's the ultimate output. Do you have excess glutamate signaling? Do you have too little GABA signaling? Um, what our neurons do? What's their connectivity doing is probably the lesson that we're learning. And they're actually applying that in the Downs field because obviously with a whole extra chromosome 21, there's no way you could target everything that's abnormal in Downs. So what they're asking, they're, the question they're asking is what's the, what, what in the end result of all of these protein excess you know, proteins that are getting made off chromosome 21. What's the end result on how neurons signal? And then can we fix that? And so, and that's, that's led to some very successful work and, and even, you know, clinical trials of, of the uh, GABA activators that they're using in, in, in Down syndrome. So I think that tells us that we, we need to take a, you know, maybe a more global approach in, in some cases, but we don't know. I mean, I, I think in the end, we don't know which thing is going to work best, which is why it's, it, which is why we've been pursuing every lead. <laughs> it makes a lot of work, though. We'll be going around campus and meeting with different groups throughout the rest of the day, and we have another one starting at 10.30, but if people want to stick around and chat with her for a few minutes, I'm sure she'd be willing to, to talk with you individually. So again, thanks very much for coming, and thank you, Liz. <laughs>